welcome back. Coming up on this week's show, news about FA Cup games coming to ESPN. Italian soccer sells out to a soft drinks maker. MLS broadcasters squabble over TV costs. NWSL announces the CBS TV plans. The Premier League wobbles on the opening day of the restart. Plus, we have letters from you, the listeners, in our mailbag section. I'm Christopher Harris, a.k.a. The Gaffer, alongside my co-host, Nick Webster. Nick, um, it's exciting, actually, to have you on the show again this week uh, for many different reasons. Uh, it's, it's a Father's Day weekend special here. But, but, but really, I'm excited because, I mean, obviously, football's back and we got the Premier League back and La Liga back and the Bundesliga's going. But what I'd like to kind of uh, focus on today, especially, is your background and experience as a producer, so a lot of the people that know you from Fox Soccer Days and Fox Soccer Channel will know you in front of the camera in terms of whether it was Fox Football Phone-In or a lot of the shows over the weekends uh, and, and the match days. But, but for, for a second or two, tell us a little bit about kind of your, your uh, experience as on the production side of behind the scenes working on soccer. Well, number one, thank you for having me back, Chris. Uh, I, I thought there would have been a uh, stuffed mailbag saying, get rid of that bald English wanker. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, was, it was funny. I was uh, um, uh, you know, putting together resumes and, and the highlight packages and uh, you know, uh, best ofs. And I, I wandered onto the big soccer boards to uh, get a refresher of how uh, me and my colleagues used to be received by the, <laughs> our, our adoring public and uh, – made for some fascinating reading i've got to say i was i was in stitches over some of the comments uh people have some uh pretty fierce wit out there but no great great to be back chris and yeah i mean it, look it was it was a fantastic experience working at fox and and i was really uh given free reign um which then allowed me to you know cover world cups and uh european championships etc and it wasn't until I would say 2011 when uh, Fox started paying attention to the ratings we were getting that, you know, big Fox sports decided to uh, stick their, their noses into what we were doing. And for me personally, that was, you know, the kind of day it ended for me because they wanted to, and the, they, I, I mean, the, uh, the suits wanted to Americanize soccer and, and I think we saw that a lot in the coverage where it became more about – less about the football and more about the voices. I mean you, you're having Piers Morgan on and uh, Alexi and uh, it, it was more, you know, oh, let's have a look at, you know, Victoria Beckham. You know, the, mm -hmm. these were the stories that they wanted us to pursue and that wasn't my forte and uh, – that's when producing became very, very difficult. But uh, ov overall, when we were left on our own devices, I, I, I thought considering the resources we had available to us, we, we did an incredible job. And, and my, my one regret is that, you know, in 2011, 2012, when the resources did start coming our way, we didn't get to use them in the best way to and I don't want to say educate the uh, American soccer fan because they don't really need educating, but to give them a more uh, give them a product that was more authentic mm -hmm. and not americanized yeah yeah nick it, that's something that we could probably spend a whole show on because I, I know kind of the old fox soccer and and uh, kind of the current fox soccer and the differences in terms of the philosophies the spending um the shoestring budget back in the day versus kind of the budgets these days and and just the the types of coverage and and you know, we, we could probably spend actually more than a show on that but but we're going to go back to this uh this week or this past week in terms of uh, the football that's been on television and putting your production hat on um what were your thoughts about the the first day and and, and we're recording this on thursday what was your f thoughts about the first day of the the premier league uh, coming back on nbc sports well, it was interesting because I know NBC definitely had some uh, production issues uh, in the first game. Um, audio, there were some audio issues. And then for some reason, we got a, a still shot of the London Eye for uh, about two minutes. I don't know if everybody got that, but I, I certainly got that. And, 
you know, I, 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 uh, it was funny as I'm sitting there watching it, I'm thinking to myself, Oh, I know what's going on in the control room right now. You know, there's, yeah. there's a lot of raised, a lot of raised voices and, uh, the, the technical, technical director was probably busy punching buttons going, Oh my God, where is the feed gone? Where is the feed? Um, so yeah, that, that first game was a little challenging. Uh, I don't think we had, uh, the, uh, the crowd noise in the first half either. And I know from the, uh, the commentators in the second game, Arlo and, uh, uh, Graham, Graham Lasso. Yeah, Graham Lasso uh, was saying that they didn't get the audio feed of the crowd noise in the first half, and I remember Lasso saying it, it felt like they were in a library, you know, talking to each other. But you know, it, I, from from a production point of view, you know, NBC have done a, a remarkable job. They they very rarely get things wrong. Uh, very smooth, slick operation, um, and. I, in in all honesty, I I wasn't terribly distracted by the lack of crowd in the uh, in the Man City game because of the uh, the ambient noise. Yeah. I think it added to it, and 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 the fact that City was so was so good as well really <laughs> kept your mind focused fully on the football. Right. Uh, I, the, you know the the, the one uh, downside. You know, it's when you when you step away. So I went to the kitchen to make a cup of tea, and usually, you know, you can hear the crowd building when something's about to happen, and you can rush back in and 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 catch something. But you did you didn't get it in this kind of format, which is yeah, it's not surprising. But you know, overall, uh, you know, I, I give them a, a solid uh, eight out of ten for their for their production. Yeah, it's a bit difficult though too because a lot of this probably were were faults of the the, the world feed, the the, the feed that um, NBC Sports is getting from the Premier League, and not so much NBC Sports because the the audio difficulties. It started actually before the match even started. You went into the stadium, into Villa Park. You had the silence first of all. I thought there would have been kind of the crowd noise. You had a drum going, which I'm not sure what that was all about. Then you had the PA system, which was really loud. Uh, you had the coin toss, which you were supposed to hear. You were supposed to hear that in every game. You couldn't really hear it. I think Rebecca Lowe basically apologized. And then you had the, the match itself kicked off. And then the, and, and there was crowd noise, but it just, it was so, it was all over the place because you had the mic from the, well, the, the effects mic around the pitch. So you'd hear the ball getting kicked. Uh, you'd hear the PA. You'd hear uh, the commentators, of course, and then you'd hear some crowd noise. But the crowd noise was really, really poor. Um, in the second half, it was much better. Uh, actually, at halftime, I think Rebecca Lowe apologized on air. Second half was much, much better. You had some like Villa, Villa chants in there, and the volume t- was turned up so you could actually hear it mo- more. But uh, but then there was issues with uh, the audio and video not syncing up. So you'd uh, you'd see the kick of a ball, and a split second later, you'd, you'd hear the sound. Uh, so it, it was a com- complete and utter mess. I mean, in some ways, um, I feel sorry for the Sheffield United, uh, which we'll get into a little bit in terms of the, the fans and and the players and the club. But it was a not a high profile match. I mean, of course, the second match, the Man City Arsenal one. Most people were tuning in for that one, and a lot of those issues were resolved for that. But I, I don't know, Nick. I, I'm th- I'm I'm thinking for this weekend, and, and I'm sure NBC is going through this right now. I mean, I'm thinking that it might be better off going with the natural sound and just screw the uh, the EA Sports artificial crowd noise because I, I, to me, it's nowhere in the air as good as the Bundesliga. And La Liga is using something similar, the technology, but there is is a lot quieter. But to me, in that Man City Arsenal match, yeah, yeah, Man City we were on fire, but uh, the, the noise was distracting. It was just kind of a constant buzz, and it and it didn't really match up with what was happening on the pitch as far as those exciting moments, those near misses, those oohs and ahs. Um, I I did not like it at all. Yeah, it's interesting that the, the oohs and ahs really do make the sport. For, for me, uh, because you know, football is about the close shaves, you know, and the 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 slow, steady build up to that orgasmic, the ball hitting the back of the net. Yeah. Um. But you know, you know, I think um, it's it's like anything else, Chris. We are. This is the new normal, which is completely abnormal, and it's going to take time to get used to it. Um. And I think we're going to have you know 
a good six to eight weeks of of getting used to this. Um, it's it's a brand new frontier from a from a production point of view, and I'm sure there's there's talks going on in the you know the highest echelons of of ESPN and uh, of NBC of how to navigate this uh, this new environment. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be there's going to be pros, people going, yeah, we love it, and and cons, no, we hate it. And ultimately, it's going to be come down to the executive producer who who ha- who gets to make the decision. I mean, listen, uh, when 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 I was at Fox. And, um, you know, Dermot McQuarrie was, was my executive producer and, and, and Eric Shanks was the, 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 the big lord of all of, of, of Fox Sports. I, many times I did not agree with their decisions uh, as a, number one, as a, as a football person, as a football fan, as a football producer, and, and uh, as someone who felt like I had my pulse to what, the people wanted, you know, when you when you're stuck in your ivory towers as as Dermot and Shanks were, mm-hmm. you know that they're, they're not getting the uh, the pulse of the nation. I certainly was, and I would I would you know bring suggestions to them, and they, and they would just be you know they would be thrown out. Why? Because they got to make the big decisions. So um, as much as you know, you may hate it. The uh, the EVP of NBC may go. You know what? I love this Nat sound, and 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 we're keeping it. Mm-hmm. What, what I did like was the attempt. The attempt was to try to mix more of hearing the the players on the pitch and the, and the coaches, you know, the managers on the sidelines, and and the fans. So, which was a little bit different because with the Bundesliga, with the artificial sound, it's pretty much all crowd noise, and you hear the, I mean, the singing, the songs, and all that. Um, and with this, it was a little bit of a mixture of both. You did hear the players still, and then you heard the fans, and and, may, and maybe that was part of the issue too, is where you're having both of those. Uh, sounds coming in, audio coming in, and you have to try to mix it uh, in live, real time. That that, that caused it to be um, so disappointing, and, and that's the thing. I think probably the biggest thing about this too, uh, Nick, is that with the Premier League, prior to this, you look at b- back at like say the last five, ten years, they've been one of the leaders in production quality. I mean, you compare that to Serie A, or compare that to uh, other leagues, and and almost always the Premier League is at the top of its game. But for this, though, I would say the Bundesliga, you mean, is completely far ahead of this in terms of not just the crowd noise, but uh, how smoothly the Bundesliga started their season off. And, and yeah, and I'm sure if I go back and think about it, there were some mistakes here and there, too, but uh, a lot more polished. And for me, on the opening day of the season, or the opening day of the restart, it's not a good look. And especially, too, with NBC Sports looking at this, not having any live sports for the last three months they're they're banking on this. They're saying, okay, this is our chance to go ahead and take soccer matches and and have them on mainstream television, and and not many sports being watched, uh, well, not many sports being played at all. Here's a chance to actually uh, bump up the TV ratings, and I'm sure within the corridors of, of NBC Sports, I'm sure they were furious yesterday. But uh, yeah, it, overall, I was really disappointed with the actual production quality. Well, you bring up a really good point about uh, the Bundesliga and the sound mixing. And I want you to think about this for just a second. The sound mixers at NBC, uh, I guarantee you, are not football people. They're sound mixing people. Mm -hmm. And so to get that rhythm down is going to take some time. I I would venture to say that the sound people in Germany are probably Bundesliga fans and have supported the club since they were four or five years old. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know the sound mixers at the NBC studio, but I'm pretty sure they weren't raised with football. And so it, the, the game, as you know, has its own delightful rhythm mm-hmm. that, that is one of the reasons why it's such a special game. Football definitely has its own rhythms. And, And I know this may sound egotistical, but only those that have been brought up and thoroughly understand the game really get the rhythms. If you if you had a if you had a sound guy, a mixing guy who was steeped in the the art of football, I'm pretty sure that they could do a masterful job of creating that audio atmosphere that you as a person at home would go, oh, it feels like the crowd's there. Yeah. And that's the thing, though, too, is that 
at NBC Sports, they had to be wondering, like, maybe we'll just take one of our, maybe one of our future Nick Webster interns, but but taking somebody from internal that knows soccer that says, okay, all right, your job is to go ahead and do the audio mix for this because of the crowd noise and just create the different sounds. And and I'm sure that person probably could, probably could do a better job than what we've heard on this uh, opening day of this restart. Um I guess we'll have to wait and see. I, I'm, I'm leaning towards going with the natural sound, which is not what I was envisioning before these matches were played. But, but Nick, speaking of the matches, what were your thoughts just on the football itself on, on that uh, opening day of the restart? Well, I wasn't expecting a goal fest from Villa and Sheffield United. You know, I thought Villa would be really happy with the point. Obviously, the goal line technology fiasco uh, was huge and... Uh, in more ways than one, being that I had Norwood on my fantasy team. Uh, so lost six very valuable points there. And just a shout out to any of the listeners. I am 17,000 in the world. Wow. There are 17, seven and a half million players. Uh, I'm, I'm looking to move into the top 10,000. I actually had peaked at 7,000 in the world earlier in the season. So, uh, but yes, having the Norwood goal disallowed really stuck in the crawl. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that, that was a fiasco. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it's, it's kind of what I expected from both teams. Um, you know, I, I think Villa are happy with the point. Sheffield United probably happy with the point as well. And then the second game was just, uh, you know, <laughs> It was like Man City had never been away. They were yeah. they were quite superb and and just such a joy to watch. And Arsenal, you know, typical Arsenal. I mean, was it six years now since they've beaten a top six side away from home? Um, and when you got a joker like David Luiz um, in your back four, you're always going to give up chances. Uh, you know, Arsenal have got a long, long way to go. I mean, it really is quite remarkable how much they have fallen off the echelon of elite teams in, in, in the Premier League. For me, Nick, it was uh, it felt like pre-season a little bit, uh, watching those games on Wednesday, um, the Aston Villa-Sheffield United game, like two teams just uh, battling it out. But the um, yeah the Man City-Arsenal game, it seemed that like Man City even kind of almost like warming up to getting ready for you know, FA Community Shield or something like that. Arsenal still trying to figure out what they're, they're trying to do there. But, but, but the other thing about it too is that lots of injuries, lots of injury, lots of delays in the games. You have the water breaks. So, um, and, and then that crowd noise, which is kind of a constant buzz throughout the, uh, the, the game, the 90 minutes, it, it feels fake because even during lulls or water breaks or things like that, I think the crowd noise is still at that same level, kind of buzzing and hearing that noise. But um, yes, my, my hopes are that uh, Friday and onwards will be much better in terms of uh, the football on display. And in this past couple of weeks too, actually, well, this past week, I've watched a ton of La Liga matches. And uh, for whatever reason, just it seems to be in terms of the technical skill and how competitive those teams are. I've been a lot more impressed by La Liga. Of, of course, this is only two Premier League matches in, so you can't really compare it uh, too much. But uh, I've been really impressed by La Liga. I mean, I mean, with the Bundesliga, there were so many one-sided matches, so many, uh, you mean, six nils, five nils, five ones, and just uh, really one-sided games. La Liga, almost every single single game I've seen has been either a draw um, or very close, like kind of a late winner. Um, and the, the match fitness seems to be up much higher. And again, too, I, I don't know if that's what, preparation, what they've been doing differently than, say, the Premier League. But uh, but yeah, thumbs up uh, for La Liga for, for me from this past week. Well, La Liga's always been a, a more technical league than uh, either the Bundesliga or the, or the Premier League. And listen, I think the, the, the draw of the Premier League has, has always been, you know, full stadiums and the fact that teams go, you know, 100 miles an hour at each other and they're, they're driven on by the fans. And, you know, we're, we're not going to see that over the next six weeks. I think we're, we're going to see more of a, of a technical game. And it's going to be interesting to see how the English players adapt to that. Um, because, you know, they're, they're, they're the ones that love the blood and thunder of the English game. That's that's what they've been brought up upon. And it's, and it's always been the foreign players that have uh, generally provided the, shall we say, the uh, the cherry on top of the cake, you know, right. with their class and, 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 and their, uh, their high this... level of skill. Yep. Um, so... Are we going to see? Are you going to see a big change? I, I think it's going to take. 
I think it's going to take a couple of weeks, Chris, for them to 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 get up to that match speed that we're that we're used to seeing in in the Premier League, um, and so I get I guess you know you, you're going to have to have me on the show in about four weeks' time to uh, so we can compare and contrast. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and and with the Bundesliga too, I mean, coming close to the end of the season, of course, Bayern Munich wrapping up the title. Uh, I think they're what plus sixty four in goal difference. And just like light years ahead of any other teams, um, with everything going on on Wednesday, that got kind of lost in the mix. Um, and I think for most people, unless you're a Bundesliga diehard, you're, you're switching allegiances and watching whether it's the, the Premier League, La Liga, or, or getting ready for Serie A, which kicks off this weekend. And speaking of Serie A, I'm not sure if you caught this, Nick, because Wednesday was a very, very busy day. But uh, did you catch any of the uh, Coppa Italia final on ESPN? I didn't catch any of the game, but obviously read all the match reports. But you know, you you bring up a good, you know, a, a little interesting point about people's interests. And you know, you look at the Bundesliga. Listen, Bayern Munich are a fantastic team. I love watching them play. But you know, no one else has won in Germany for eight years. Okay, so a bit boring. You've got the same situation in Italy with Juventus. Okay, in Spain, it's you know it's either been uh, Real or Barcelona. I think Atletico got one title in like 2013 or something like that. But in the Premier League, there, there actually have been four different winners in the last eight years. You know, Chelsea, uh, United, City, Leicester. and and Leicester. Yeah. yeah, well, five in fact. Um, so, you know, it's 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 that um, it's that competition that I think. You know, even though Liverpool have run, run away with it this year, it is that competition that is the the thing that draws us in. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. One hundred percent. It's it's that uh, rather than one sided matches, it's those two sided matches where you mean going into a game and, and coming out of it. I mean, you never know what's going to happen. But but going back to that Coppa Italia final for a second, though, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, it's all right, you're right. You missed it, but boy, did you miss something on this one. So if 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 I had to rank or rate the best uh, virtual experience, which is a strange uh, thing to be talking about, who who would have thought six months ago we'd be talking about this? But the Bundesliga, in terms of that match TV watching experience, I, I'd put I'd put number one. Uh, even though it's early days, I'd put La Liga as number two, Premier League as number three, but hoping that they can fix things. And then number four is uh, Coppa Italia, which is um, a you know, cup competition, Italian cup competition that's run by Serie A. And this one, oh my gosh, Nick, this this was like, I just hope that um, executives, whether they're uh, sponsors of uh, major brands or of big uh, like Fox Sports or ESPN didn't see this because what happened in the game, so uh, Coppa Italia has a brand new sponsor. So it's now the Coca-Cola Coppa Italia and what they did was they had uh, the whole stadium filled with virtual fans, just like La Liga, which is fine. But they had them jumping up and down. So you're trying to watch the match and all you see are these these little characters jumping up and down in unison. So that's completely distracting. You're trying to watch the match. That's that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, they were coloured, oh, colour coded. So you on the main camera, uh, you'd have all the fans in red. Well, this was Napoli. You mean blue against yeah. uh, Juventus in black and white? Uh, where's the red coming from? Well, the red. The third thing was the red is, is that it's Coca Cola, and there was a massive virtual Coca Cola banner right on the main camera. You'd see it the whole time, and then you had the fans jumping up and down wearing the red, and it, it's basically a, a, like a commercial or an infomercial in the middle of the game. Um, the match itself, too, very much like the Premier League, too, felt like a preseason match. Um, even the semifinals of the Coppa Italia have been very, I don't know, lacklustre. Uh, a lot of missed chances, a lot of, um, I mean, just it, players just warming up. The players are not 100% match fit yet or match ready. And, and it showed. So the match itself wasn't that exciting. Napoli winning it and penalty kicks was great. But uh, this is uh, concerning to me. I just hope that uh, we don't see more of this. I, don't, I hope that uh, others don't ado- adopt this type of technology and say, hey, let's just fill the stadium of virtual people and virtual advertisements. Well, you know, the Italians love doing things their own way. They are very, very special. Um, but yes, I, I actually, I, I was very happy to see that Napoli uh, 
triumphed on penalties. I mean, too, too often you, Juventus just wins everything and uh, always nice to get a, a different name on the trophy. But I think we're going to be seeing lots of different experiments, to be honest with you, Chris. Yeah. Um, re- regarding, you know, how, how do you fill a, a, a virtual stadium? Um, and I think, th- I think there's going to be some serious uh, misses. Uh, and th- there will be a hit, and, and they'll figure out, you know, the, look, these, these TV companies, they got a lot of money, they got a lot of smart people. They will figure it out, and um, they'll come up with a solution that uh, I think 95% of us will be happy with. I, I just had a laugh for a second too. Uh, the fourth thing that was uh, funny about this too, oh, scary in a way, uh, that I, I forgot to mention is that so you had all these virtual fans jumping up and down, but there was no crowd noise. So you've got like a, a stadium that's filled with like what fifty thousand virtual fans, and all you're hear, hearing is the players and the coach or the manager. There's no crowd noise, so it's it's just a strange situation to be watching that match and. Um, Fair play to Mark Donaldson and Matteo Bonetti. I think they made a couple of jokes during the commentary about it. But uh, I don't know. To me, it cheapens the game. It cheapens the, the cup. And uh, and I'm wondering, too, if Serie A, starting this weekend, if they're going to do the same thing. Hopefully, they'll learn the lessons. And, and like you said, too, this is all work in progress. This is all brand new. And hopefully, they'll they'll listen to I mean, the viewers and the soccer fans and, and make the right decisions. Yeah, I, I, I think they will. I mean... It's 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 so important that as as a product, um, you know, we want it to be somewhat unified. But then again, every country is going to have their own quirks, um, and it's and and they're going to they're going to start you know beg, borrow, and stealing from each other. Yeah. Um, and I you know I really think that within the next two weeks we're going to we're going to see a model that incorporates bits and pieces from all around the different European leagues and broadcasters are going to go, yeah, we love this. And, and you'll, you'll start seeing some standardiz- standardization. So let's move on to TV streaming news. And uh, first up is Major League Soccer broadcasters are reportedly squabbling over the production costs for the MLS is back tournament. Hence the reason why no TV schedule has been released yet. The draw was one week ago. Uh, The tournament is scheduled to begin in less than three weeks. So ESPN is producing the entire tournament, which will be played at the company's wide world of sports complex. It will be their cameras, producers and directors uh, putting putting out the feeds that will be available for broadcast by other networks, both inside and outside of the U.S., The Athletic is reporting that there's been a big disagreement between Fox and ESPN. ESPN typically spends around $100,000 to produce an MLS regular season match. The network plans to add some bells and whistles in Orlando, which combined with the cost of housing its crews in Florida for an extended period, will raise its average production cost to around $125,000 per match. Fox usually spends significantly less on its broadcast, with sources placing their average around $75,000 for regular season matches shown on FS1. And hence the reason why Fox is squabbling over how much money they want to pay ESPN for the privilege of broadcasting the game. And uh, for ESPN and and the tournament, most of the games, or a significant chunk of those games, of those 54 games, will be on ESPN or ESPN2, but many of them also will be on Fox and Univision, to do any. Nick, what's your take on this? What's your experience in terms of uh, producing a match? And and, uh, can you see the the, the executives of Fox kind of uh, fighting for this one and and perhaps uh, reaching a compromise, perhaps? Well, it's it's interesting that you know ESPN is saying that it costs that much money. Um, I'm not sure it's going to cost you know 120, 140 grand a match at the uh, the Wide World Complex of Sports, mainly because once they get the cameras set in there, you know there's going to be a one-time installation fee, but then all the matches are going to be played there. So I would imagine that the production costs will come down massively. Um, Overall, right. uh, it doesn't surprise me that you know Fox isn't interested in in that kind of uh, that kind of money, and that their productions are certainly uh, a, a lot cheaper than ESPN's. Um, 
but it it does seem it does seem a strange one when you know you're going to have something close to what is it 50 60 matches at the yep, the 54. World West End of 54 yeah um that the the two companies who you know are are, are bedfellows uh, are not coming together to say okay look this this is the cost um depending on how many games we're we're going to be broadcasting uh, you know there's there's a prorated amount involved for fox so um i i what i think is that you know fox is looking at the tea leaves and and saying to themselves we don't think we're going to get a lot of viewers for this um yeah. we, we'd, we'd rather not spend a lot of money and 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 dump it all on espn and uh ESPN certainly doesn't want them to be holding the bag because uh, you know fifty-four matches times uh, you know a hundred hundred and something thousand dollars. And that sounds like uh, six point seven million. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's scary. Um, yeah, no, it's it, it's it's a lot of money, and I mean, you know, advertisers are not. I'm pretty sure are not going to be running to jump on board to you know, be part of and um, promote games that are going to have a feel of, like I said to you last week, you know, perhaps being played in a park because, you know, the, the, the stadiums at the, the complex, mm-hmm. they're not the biggest. And I mean, the one thing that the, the, you know, the European leagues have about them, yes, they're playing in, playing in front of no fans, but the stadiums still have gravitas and it still looks like it could be an important match. As opposed to, you know, just some signage around a, a, a field with some, you know, portable bleachers. Um, yeah, so I can, I can see why Fox are kind of moving in the uh, other direction. Yeah, and that's the thing, though, too, about this uh, wide world of sports um, it, park, which, which is a good word for it. It is a very kind of a wide, expansive uh, number of fields in 20, 20 to 25 fields. Um, it's, it is more of a, a bleacher setup. So, um, so a lot of that this this the pressure really is on ESPN here too because ESPN not only uh, is taking the risk of having their their talent and well actually their crews uh, filming and producing this uh, on site. Uh, some of it might be done remote, remotely, but they're going to have people on site. Um, but I mean, the six point seven million approximately um, cost of actually setting this up and running this, and with Fox saying, "Okay, hey, we're not willing to pay X amount of dollars. We want to, you mean, we, we, we want far less than that." Because on, up on top, on top of that, too, Fox still has to pay their talent. You mean, know, they were sitting around. You mean, the Stu Holdens, the Alexi Lalases, the John Strongs, etc. So um, I wonder too if, if MLS will consider if there's no agreement reached anytime soon of kind of stepping in and trying to figure out some type of, uh, you mean, I don't know, something something um, monetarily wise to to try to make this happen because in many ways the future of MLS depends on this because if MLS goes through this ent- entire season without playing matches, yes, there's a chance of playing games uh, in the fall. There's no guarantee of that. And with the COVID numbers increasing, especially in Florida, there's always a risk that the season may not, not actually happen. So a lot of the pressure is on ESPN and then a lot of pressure is on MLS. And, and I think Fox in some ways probably knows that. They know that uh, they have a little bit of leverage. I mean, it's not that uh, there's a huge demand for these games. And like you said, Nick, I, I don't think the expectation is that uh, I don't think there's going to be a lot of people tuning in for this. But the other thing, and we, and we didn't get to this last week too, is talking a little bit more about the the times of these games. So the times each day it's going to be nine a.m. Eastern, so like what six in the morning Pacific time. So even for the uh, Pacific time, yeah, you can rule that out. I mean, no one's going to be watching those games, pretty much. Uh, even nine a.m. Eastern, in terms of you mean know, a lot of people are back at work. That's not a good time either. Uh, conversely, later in the day, the, the games are at eight Eastern and ten thirty Eastern. So the ten thirty Eastern for the East Coast crowd, a lot of people are probably going to think, okay, that's too late to watch those games. And if it says ten thirty Eastern, by the time MLS kicks the game off, usually it's like what about fifteen minutes to half an hour later. Sometimes uh, there's no guarantee that that's actually the kickoff time. So that eight p.m. Eastern time, five p.m. Pacific time is the sweet spot. Is that kind of like that, that one game a day where both the East Coast, the West Coast, and the Midwest can come together to watch that game, which is probably going to be on ESPN. So there's a lot of question marks about this. 
And I, I just find it really interesting that um, this wasn't worked out beforehand. I mean, so it's been a week since the draw. We're still waiting for the schedule. The expectations are now that the, uh, the actual schedule won't be until next week, which is only two weeks before the tournament starts. And lastly, it doesn't give uh, the broadcasters or MLS uh, or the clubs much time to to get some promotions out there, get some advertising out there, get some uh, publicity out there. It's a really sh- uh, tight window. No, it really does seem like it's been thrown together. Um, you know, if, if, if I'm being uh, quite brutal, it seems it just seems to me like this was an idea that was hatched in a, in a boardroom with some people sitting around going, oh, yeah, wow, let's do this without a great deal of forethought to it. And the other thing that I would be very concerned about if I was MLS is that the NBA has the potential to be starting up at around the same time with a, with a, with a similar style, uh, not a similar style tournament, but a, a, t- a tournament of such. And that would go directly up against anything that MLS had. And uh, I, I just see that the, the, the crossover, the crossover audience is going to stick with the NBA, yeah. uh, and yeah. and not with soccer. So, I I I think that uh, you know ESPN is probably going to lose a, a ton of money on this, um, but maybe they're maybe they're thinking more the long game uh, because obviously the uh, MLS rights, I believe they're up for uh, yep twenty twenty two. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they could be thinking long game here. Um, if, if Fox and, and, and it looks more likely that Fox are getting out of the soccer business, except for um, World Cups, uh, you know, men's and women's, that, um, you know, ESPN is positioning itself to be the worldwide leader in soccer because right now, you know, they, the ESPN Plus, which I think is an outstanding app. Uh, full of amazing content. Um, if, if they if they see soccer as something viable, um, may, may, maybe they're going to make a big play for MLS and uh, try and turn it into something that Sky has done with the uh, Premier League in England. Yeah, and at the same time too, the Premier League rights uh, for the next cycle are also up uh, in uh, 2022. So next year is going to be a huge uh, year for. Uh, bidding and TV rights and acquisitions of of rights. So, if it, if an ESPN came along and gobbled up the uh, the Premier League rights for the 2022 season onwards, uh, you're looking at. I mean, the majority of international club soccer uh, is would be ESPN. That would be the go to place, and then you'd have the the Champions League on on CBS. You'd have I mean MLS on on ESPN perhaps, and and. Uh, most of the majority of the major soccer, other than the World Cup, uh, would be on ESPN. Now, the other thing... Well, that, it, go ahead, sorry, Nick, go it, ahead. It's, 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 it's going to be very interesting to actually see how much these rights go for, because obviously the world economy is in a massive downturn. Uh, the last set of rights that NBC paid for they went for a record amount. Um, I don't think the uh, Premier League are going to get the kind of money they, that they're used to getting. Right, right. And at the same time, too, I have to wonder whether NBC Sports will be willing to pay as much as they did last time, which ended up being about a billion dollars for these rights uh, to the Premier League. And the numbers are decent for the Premier League, but I don't think they have grown to what they expected. And uh, you also have new executives, new people within the NBC Sports organization that, that weren't back there t- in 2012 and 2013. It's, it's, a, it's a whole new set of people that may not have the, the same uh, interest in the Premier League in the future. Um, yes, it has put NBCSN on the map, but uh, there's plenty of other sports out there too. And uh, at a billion dollars plus, perhaps, maybe more, depending if there's a bidding war, uh, that might be a little bit too much. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. We're still a ways off for that. But, but speaking of uh, TV, um, also this week too, we had uh, the NWSL that announced their TV schedule. And uh, we're looking at June 27th through July 26th, uh, playing the uh, 2020 Challenge Cup in Utah. And the way they're doing it, to me, sounds uh, more logical. Uh, what they're doing is having two matches a day. So the opening game of the season is on uh, CBS, over-the-air CBS, as well as CBS All Access, which is their streaming platform. 
And then the, the cup final, the, the final game in this tournament, will also be on CBS and on CBS All Access. All the other matches are going to be on CBS All Access. So this is really a play to get people uh, to subscribe or check out the free trial on CBS All Access and put them on the map. With the timing of the games, it's the same time every single day, so like, like clockwork. And the kickoff times are 12.30 Eastern time and 10 p.m. Eastern time. And, and to me, in terms of uh, looking at that compared to MLS, this is probably something that's a little bit more manageable. You get uh, you mean a 9.30 in the morning Pacific time kickoff, a 12.30 uh, Eastern time. You can watch the game during lunchtime. And then a 10 o'clock Eastern or a 7 p.m. Pacific time. Um, a little bit earlier than the t- that 10.30 MLS game too. So there's opportunities here. Not expecting massive uh, viewing numbers for any of these by any means, but it is uh, a good plan by NWSL and, and maybe it'll work. We'll have to wait and see as far as how successful it will be. Well, I think it's a trial run actually by CBS for when they take over the Champions League next uh, the year after next. Yep. Um, you know, obviously, those kind of time slots are, are Champions League time slots. Um, I think uh, they're using this to bed in producers um, who can understand the soccer format, so to speak. I mean, this is CBS's first foray into into the beautiful game, and I think it's pretty smart of them actually to use the uh, NWSL as as their uh, as their guinea pig. You know, you you don't want to dri- drive. Sorry, jump straight in with a champions with the high-profile Champions League game and get absolutely slaughtered for your your soccer coverage. Um, you know, as as you know, Chris, we're uh, we're quite critical, uh, <laughs> quite right. critical viewers, and so and so that, that they, I think that I think uh, they're using this to you know iron out um, bugs that will will absolutely occur. In, uh, in their soccer productions, and, and they'll be able to do it without a very critical uh, audience uh, checking their every move. So yep. fair play to CPS on this one. Yeah, it's also a good sweetener to, to try out CBS All Access. I've not, I haven't tried it before. I know it's got Star Trek and a bunch of other programs that I'm not really interested in. But I mean, with NWSL, I'll, I'll give it a chance and, and see how the, the streaming platform is. Last but not least, in terms of uh, TV news, and that is that uh, ESPN is moving more games to television. So again, three months ago, we would have not expected this, but uh, ESPN is going to have uh, two of the FA Cup quarterfinals on the big ESPN. So the flagship network, it's going to be the Norwich against Man United and Sheffield United against Arsenal quarterfinals uh, later in June. I think it's like June 27th and June 28th. And uh, the, both those games will still be on ESPN Plus, and the uh, the other quarterfinals will be on ESPN Plus also. And as far as the schedule goes, right now the semifinals of the FA Cup and the final will be exclusively on ESPN Plus. But there's always a possibility that it might change. So I, th- I think it's a smart move. I mean, it, again, it's uh, getting more people used to watching matches. Um, yeah, there's nothing much on anyway as far as live sports, so. Have them watch the FA Cup. If they're interested, they can subscribe to ESPN Plus and watch uh, the rest of the FA Cup all the way through to the final. Yeah, smart move by ESPN. As, as I said, I, I, the, the, the way they are they're positioning themselves, I, I really see a, a big play um, and, and wouldn't even put it past ESPN to maybe even go ESPN the soccer channel, much like you know Fox Soccer Channel did back in the day. You know, create a a channel that's devoted purely to uh, to the beautiful game. I mean, be in sports. Uh, you know, you, you hear so many different things, but perhaps they're getting out of the business of La Liga, which would then put those rights up for grabs. And I mean, should ESPN get that, it would be very much like you know Fox Soccer back in the day. I mean, when I when I first went to Fox Sports World, Chris, we had the Premier League, we had the Bundesliga, we had the Serie A. We picked up select games from La Liga. Um, it was, you know, just the best football in the world every single day. Yep, yep. And it's weird in a way, though, too, Nick, because things have changed so much. So back in the day, back then, it was fantastic because we'd go from a La Liga match on an early Saturday morning to a 10 a.m. Eastern time Premier League match, sometimes a Bundesliga, uh, depending on which, which uh, cycle it was in. Uh, sometimes I think even the Argentine match with Max Bretos. 
and uh, you'd go th- through the whole entire weekend watching probably like six or seven matches and you mean getting the news and I mean, it was great these days though it's so different though you know what I mean in terms of somebody it, it's become almost very um cult like where someone's like a fan of say major league soccer and that person will only watch major league soccer and will not watch much else and vice versa someone that's a hardcore la liga fan or a hardcore premier league fan or a hardcore but i mean you go, you go down the list uh, back in the day nick it, it seemed to be a lot more uh, equal opportunity as far as going kind of, the best matches from around the world on television and we're picking these to, to show to you i wonder how that would work in these days if people would be more uh, receptive to that or not well i think it's an interesting uh, interesting idea um I I think uh, I I preferred the old days, Chris. You know, it was it was, it was great. Uh, one place, <laughs> right. you know, not not ten different providers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that, that. It's become a full time job for me now too. It's just trying to dissect all the changes, and actually, even this weekend too, with Peacock launching, uh, showing the Premier League match, the Bournemouth Crystal Palace game. So I have to spend my afternoon like basically just watching Peacock and, and for the first time ever filming it and producing something this weekend to actually show people how it works, answering all those questions and almost becoming like a, a technical support or customer support. Uh, I enjoy doing that, but it is it is very complicated for somebody who just wants to watch football. And that's the thing, though, too, with something, if it's an ESPN soccer channel, that would provide it, make it simpler, make it a, an easy subscription fee. And they can watch, I mean, everything throughout the entire 24-7, basically. All right, moving on to TV ratings. We won't go through every number here, too, but we will have the numbers at worldsoccertalk.com on the homepage within the next uh, within the next uh, 24 hours. But some of the, the numbers that have come through, uh, Bayern Munich against uh, Mönchengladbach, uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach, on Saturday was 359,000 viewers uh, on FS1 and Unamas combined. Uh, the number for Unamas was, I think, 135,000 people there. Then we had the return of La Liga. And even though BN Sports is not on DirecTV, it's not on Comcast, um, it is available pretty much everywhere else. Uh, Mallorca against Barcelona, uh, which is a great ma- match. I really enjoy this one. 316,000 viewers uh, tuned into that one. And then the Real Madrid against Ibar game on the Sunday. I missed this one, unfortunately, but 251,000 viewers on BN Sports and BN Sports and Espanol. So with the number of uh, the dis- distribution of BN Sports being about 10 to 15 million subscribers, pretty solid numbers um, for BN Sports and, and, and two of the biggest uh, uh, teams in the world. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think they're great numbers. Um uh, and it just goes to prove that you know the the power of the sport and, and the demand for it is is out there. Of course, you know we're we're not talking in the millions, but we also got to remember that the sport has been off the airways for the last three months, and it's going to take uh, it take time for you know people to to rediscover it again, especially the uh, should we say the the fair weather fans. Yeah. But the, the the fair weather fans are the ones that really uh, start driving advertising numbers. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and we'll get the numbers too for uh, Wednesday's uh, Premier League matches and we'll add that to the worldsoccertalk.com website. So so check that out. Uh, listener mailbag. Uh, first up is Eric Coulton. Eric says, hey guys, thanks for keeping up the podcasts over the lockdown. And uh, no problem there, Eric. We enjoy doing it. Uh, next up is Edward. Um, he says, Bundesliga production of tactics analysis has been good. I really like their breakdown of goal probability. And I'm not sure if you saw this one, Nick, but actually last weekend it was something new. So usually at halftime during the Bundesliga matches, they have kind of a promo reel running that has a little bit of, um, you know, maybe a focus on one of the players. But what they've started to doing is, uh, in combination with Amazon Web Services, is having a segment uh, that goes a deep dive into the tactical analysis. And they had goal cr- goal probability uh, stats uh, throughout the weekend, showing how likely it was for certain players. I think Thorgan Hazard was one in terms of the chances he gets in front of goal, the types of angles he gets, and the types of uh, basically the goal completion. How, how many? You know, what's the likelihood that he's going to score? And comparing that to other players, and I thought it's really well done. 
And the Bundesliga, like I said before, too, are really leading the pack t- in terms of production and partnerships they're doing. And I'm sure, too, that the Premier League and other leagues will look at this closely and say, hey, yeah, here's an opportunity to copy from some of the best out here. And what, what can we do uh, with, with a similar partnership, maybe with a Microsoft or whoever it may be? And uh, I find this a great way to bring in an advertiser and provide really, really good content to the viewer and make it feel like it's, I mean, informational, which it is, and it just doesn't feel like advertising. Well, AWS is a, an incredible service, and the technology that Amazon currently have is is really quite scary. You know, I'm sure they're listening to us right now. Um, <laughs> right, <laughs> but but you know, but but in terms of that deep dive into into player data and player metrics, uh, you know, for for soccer nerds like you and I. I mean, it's just it's like Christmas Christmas morning every day, isn't it? Um, yeah. You know, get getting that kind of detail. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a I'm a big fan of it. Um, I don't know where it's going to go. Uh, I'm sure we've only just seen the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, how the technology is going to work, and they're probably going to you know drip it in over you know the course of the next six to eight weeks, and then it will be interesting to see what happens. Uh, when the season re-ups again in, you know, late August, early September, you know, how, how many of these uh, te- technology uh, components are we, are we going to see in the new season? Uh, and, you know, to be honest with you, Chris, I, I would not be as surprised to see the, you know, it, the game itself, the five sub rule that's going to, that will remain. I wouldn't be surprised if the uh, 25 minute, 20, 20, 22 minute water break becomes part of the game as well. And, uh, they figure out a way to get advertising out of that. I, I think we're going to see some dramatic changes in, in, in the game and in the producing of TV soccer over the next six months. Yeah, I agree. And, I, and I'm sure a lot of them are thinking that long term, too, thinking, OK, let's go ahead and short term. Yeah, there's a need for this. Let's, let's go ahead and do these water breaks. But in the back of the minds and in those kind of back room conversations, they're also thinking long term in terms of, I mean, how does this change things? How does this help us in terms of global advertising, sponsors, other opportunities and do it in a really authentic way? I guess, I mean, rather than the kind of the Coca-Cola, Copa Italia, in your face, obnoxious, I mean, you're just very distracting. Next up is Disco George. Disco George says, guys, I don't think MLS cares about European soccer at all in creating the MLS's back tournament. They're looking at their domestic competition, the NBA tournament, NHL, whatever baseball decides to do, etc. That context is more important to them right now, getting back on national television before anyone else. Nick, do you agree or disagree? Um, hmm. I, I, I think uh, I, I agree with that statement. Um, eyes. Eyes are eyes on the screen. Uh, perhaps the most important thing for uh, for leagues right now, and uh, they're going to do anything they can to uh, promote promote their products. And, and look, I you know I hate calling football a product. I really do. Mm-hmm. But in in the big picture, that's what it is. It's a product that needs to be packaged and sold uh, for for the likes of these companies to uh, and these leagues to to make money. Yeah, this this is a strange one. Actually, it's a good question by Disco George and some good uh, feedback and comments. Because if you look at soccer, you mean look at world soccer. You mean MLS is going to be one of the last leagues to actually get back. Uh, Liga One has has cancelled the whole whole season. That's done and dusted. But for all the other leagues, major leagues, MLS is going to be last. But yes, within MLS, within the executives there, and within the you mean the owners. Um, yes, they're thinking about um, the actual domestic competition against competing against the NBA, competing against uh, the NFL and college football and these things and, and being first to market, being on national television. Now, I understand that. I disagree with that, though, personally. I, I think it's one of those things that uh, just because you put it on ESPN in prime time does not mean that people are actually going to tune in and watch it. It, it needs to be. I mean, there's a lot more that goes into it. There's a lot more of, I think, you, you almost need that shoulder programming. You almost need to build the context. You almost need to 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 help people along in this and, and not do a very basic football versus football thing that, that Fox did many, many years ago. 
uh, do it the way the NBC does it, which is very, uh, to me, very intelligently, very, they're not talking down to you. Um, but they are, that's, at the same time, they are explaining, you mean, the, the, the history, the tradition, the culture, the different things, but doing it in a very uh, understated way. But uh, yeah, a good, great feedback there and great uh, comments from Disco George. Next up, Robert says, uh, to say that people will watch the other countries' games before Major League Soccer is hopefully not true. Do people in the UK watch German soccer or Italians spend time watching Spanish football? If we want to continue to build strong soccer in the US, then we need to support our league. All right, Nick, this is something that uh, I think Alexi Lalas would have a, a very strong uh, opinion about this one. What do you think? Do you think that uh, in order to continue to build soccer in the U.S., that, that we have to support our league? Well, I mean, technically, yes. But as you know, fans, you, you're, you're going to want to watch the best. And if there's a you know, if there's a choice between an a La Liga game and a MLS game, you're probably going to watch. La Liga, you know, nine times out of ten, unless you happen to be a diehard supporter of um, that particular MLS game. So, I I, I think that um, the, uh, the 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 email just doesn't really carry a lot of weight. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things. Like sometimes I think. I mean, I mean, to me, we're in a globalized world, so um, no matter where you live, you can tune into you know, the streaming or television and watch or listen to practically anything around the world so if you're living in the uk and maybe you're into music or you're into uh movies uh you mean are we saying that you can only listen to bands out of you know sheffield you mean or london and, and you can't listen to or uh enjoy the best bands from around the world you mean if they're in the states or, or even movies i mean most of the best movies in the world come out of the united states um yeah to me it, it's uh, a very I wouldn't say backwards, but it's a very primitive think way of thinking. To me, it's all about watching the best, the best, and not to say that Major League Soccer is is not good. I mean, at times it can be very entertaining. It depends on which games and which teams you you have performing in front of you. But uh, but to me, I mean, I think we live in a world where we we experience and watch and eat and drink and do whatever we we do, but it's not so much focused on that local club anymore. And then it's the same thing goes in England, too. I mean, yes, going back to what Robert says, yes, people in the UK watch German soccer, not as much as the Premier League. Uh, yes, Italians watch Spanish so soccer, not as much as Serie A. But if you look at US, you look at Asia, you look at, say, uh, Malaysia or Singapore or uh, different countries in the, around the world, you look at India. I mean, most of those countries are not watching their local league in massive numbers. The most popular leagues in those countries or outside of, of those local domestic areas. All right. Yeah. All right. We, we, all right. Next up is JP. JP says the issue with the subdued augmented crowd noise may be on, on La Liga, maybe a be in sound issue uh, mix and not La Liga itself. Recall uh, when be in sports had Serie A, the noise was often lower than what the same match would be on RAI. I didn't notice a difference when they used the world feed over there in the, in the house commentary. To be fair, to be in sports, I feel the same way about Serie A matches on, on TV or Mark and Matteo for an ESPN Plus match. And last but not least, uh, Nick, uh, Adam Hay says, uh, interesting interview on World Soccer Talk with Nick Webster. Very interested to hear more about what you've got going on. So, so perfect segue here, Nick. If you can give uh, listeners an opportunity to to find out more about uh, how they can learn about uh, really kind of more the mental side of the game and everything that you've got going on and as far as the best way to, to get in touch with you. Well, um, I, I, I have had a knockback in, in the past week. My uh, my good friend Eric Winolder, who I was working with at the Las Vegas Lights, was dramatically fired yesterday. Um, so I'm still waiting to hear the full story of... Uh, of that parting of the waves. Um, and I was doing some, uh, mental work with the players. And so basically what, what I'm doing right now, I'm, uh, I'm a performance and leadership specialist and, um, I aim to get the, 
that extra three, four, five percent out of you um, through guided discovery, asking very powerful questions and getting even more powerful answers to help you become the best player you can be on the pitch and the best person you can be in life. So if you are interested in talking to me about this, you can reach me at Nick J. Webster at gmail.com. I have a program that is designed for individuals, uh, for teams, and for coaches as well who are looking to expand um, their mental capabilities, especially dealing with uh, the youngsters of today who uh, really think quite differently uh, uh, about how their approach to the game is, certainly compared to uh, those of us who are a little bit older in the tooth. So that's really what I'm up to. Um, I think it's a, it's a growing industry and uh, it's something that I'm very excited and very passionate about. And uh, also with, uh, with the Las Vegas lights departing, um, if anybody has some uh, opportunities in the USL, hey, don't be afraid to drop me a line. Yeah, definitely with the USL coming back soon, uh, that's definitely going to be hopefully a, a big opportunity there. So, listeners, we want you to have your say. You can always reach us via email through web at worldsoccertalk.com as well as facebook.com slash worldsoccertalk and on Twitter at worldsoccertalk. Plus, of course, you can post your comments on worldsoccertalk.com. And uh, you can get a new episode of the podcast every Thursday across all the podcast players. And Nick, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. So from your production uh, expertise, your coaching and playing expertise, I've enjoyed this. Thank you for your, all your insight. Once again, Chris, anytime. Pleasure to, uh, pleasure to be here. Enjoy your football.